again, repeating a little bit, uh, when we talk about models, we here deal what we could call the architecture of cities, the physical dimension of this, primarily, of course, in the aim to try to understand how that physical structure and shape influences, enhances, or uh, put hindrance to different urban processes of other kinds and human activity of different kinds. Um, and if you t speak more general about building models and urban models, there are certain ingredients that you have to have there, whether you choose to do the architecture of the city or the complete city. And one of the leading um, models in the world, Alan Wilson, uh, sets it like this, that if you are to create an urban model, you need at least this. You need no, some kind of measure of distance. You need some measure of attraction and you need some idea about how to represent space. And I started to talk a little bit about representing space, and I will continue on that. And of course, the idea here is kind of close to the gravi uh, model of uh, gravitation from uh, Newton, that if you have one city of a certain size, and then another city of a different size, and then you have a certain distance between them, you can vary the sizes and the distances, and this will generate some kind of interaction between the two, or not. Of course, this is an extremely simplified idea, and it's not really the way things work, but it still kind of uh, pinpoints these different components that are essential, and we'll try to go through them. Uh, but we are then, as I said, trying to do the architecture of the city and not the complete city, so we need to translate these a bit. So our mode of representing will be using networks, and I'll come back to that. Some measure of attraction is not, for instance, the, the size of the city of the population, it's the spatial density and differentiation, two variables that could create different kinds of attractions. And distance, finally, is not distance as often could be measured in time and all kinds of things. It is actually t uh, uh, distance in space, but also distance in space can be measured in different things. And we'll try to touch on all of these a bit. Again, brief rep re uh, re uh, repetition, that if we're talking about representation of space, we kind of focus on geometric languages of different kinds, not saying that we will not use or be necessary use these two, but it's kind of in the focus of things. And if you go into representation of space, <coughs> again, there's a myriad of different ways of doing this. Often what we do in geography and so forth, describing cities, is using what is called discrete zones. That's just saying that we have different regions that we fill with some kind of information. For instance, the population and thereby you can calculate different population densities in different parts of a city and so forth, using that. But you can also be very sophisticated creating mathematical models of different kinds that I talked about briefly in the, in the previous presentation that generates growth or changes over time and so forth. What we settle with, once again, <laughs> hugely inspired by Space Syntax work, is networks, which is a kind of an interesting combination of the two in very simple terms <coughs> uh, because networks uh, in a sense is all about relations and networks you find everywhere these days uh, describing all kind of phenomena social network we have the internet we have uh, cities not least and it's a very powerful and simple way of describing things and the essence here is actually to address the relation between things rather than the things in themselves uh, and there are also particular uh, uh, ways of representing networks using particular languages, often described as graphs. And this is an extraordinary language. It just consists of two words or two, uh, <laughs> you know. On the one hand, we have links. On the other hand, we have notes. There's nothing else in the world. Links and notes. And the extraordinary thing that this... Uh, uh, simple language, you seem able to capture so many things, essential things of what's going on in the world. For one thing, <coughs> uh, it clearly uh, addresses uh, the idea of the whole being something more than just an addition of the parts. The re particular relations within uh, the network generates particular uh, um, 
properties in the network that you cannot f uh, find in the individual parts. But importantly also that the part and the property of each part, each node here, so to speak, is, is very much given by the structure of the network as a whole. Uh, so, for instance, if we talk about cities, rather than just talking about the part, we need to understand how it's related to all other parts in the city. And if we look at that, we start to realize that, hmm, yeah, that looks nice over here, but is that actually the same thing as that over there? We can build the identical city district, but given its relation to everything else, it changes the properties of that. And the reason for that is that the networks, even though they are static in a sense, static descriptions, are extremely concerned about dynamics, about flows and interaction between the parts. So that is another dimension that is captured by this extremely simple representation that turns out to be extremely powerful, even though it's such a simple rep representation. Because the reason that we think that these are different is simply that the location here, what we Im imagine here, is that the links somehow concern some flow between the parts of some kind. It can be information or energy, but it also can be people. So, given where we are located, we are likely to have different amounts of flows. So, if we are here, maybe we have 5,000 people uh, uh, an hour passing. But if we're over here, not so far from there, maybe it's just 500. Or if we're over here, maybe it's just 50. These are not measured values, it's just estimates and just symbolic for you. So. But this is the power of it that we in read into, or the network can be a simplification of understanding potential flows between things. So we deal with networks, but again, as representations. Uh, but uh, taking that a step further, as I spoke about in the, in the uh, other presentation, more particularly, it's not really space, I would say, that we are representing. We are representing what I call affordances, something that appears in between uh, human activity and the physical environment. And this is also, this thing, to look at it in that way, is important because it opens for a much richer understanding of the built environment. For instance, Meta will talk in the afternoon about how to design cities for bumblebees. So then we, have to, we can have the same physical environment, but we realize that the affordances for a bee given by that physical environment is very different than for a human but it's another way of understanding the physical environment. So we're not stuck and it's we're describing the physical environment. We're describing the affordances that emerges between an agent, let's say, whatever it is. It could be a motor car and a human and a bee, and they all interact differently with the environment. So this is what we try to capture. And as I said <coughs> earlier, uh, uh, that is also uh, I think a powerful way of understanding the axial lines and axial maps that is fundamental for space syntax work, even though uh, these days they are scaled up uh, using uh, road center lines and so forth. So, in principle, what we have here, if we talk about axial map or a street network, <coughs> Uh, what we do more precisely in representing is that we put a node on each and every line and then we connect, connect all of these lines. For instance, that line is connected to that line here. You know the graph, the Lincoln, Lincoln node, Lincoln node, that's all that exists. So we describe this environment just in that way, uh, more precisely, and that's how we represent them. Uh, using graph descriptions, uh, this particular network. And this choice to say that the line is the node is quite important in itself. Because, of course, networks are used also in traffic planning, street networks, and uh, uh, graph representations also. But I think for a traffic planner, it would be very, very natural to say that the node is, of course, at the street crossing. But here, based on space syntax, we're not saying that. We're saying that the line is the node. And that means that what you write in, in this very, very simple language of nodes and links, is that you position a subject in a very different position than over here. What this describes is a representation where of locations of route choices. 
you know, when you need to make a rational choice. Should I go left or should I go right? This is doing something different, much more generic, saying that here I'm in a space which contains a certain information about the environment that can lead to a lot of different things. But it's a, so it's a very different type of approach. And this leads also, when you do the analysis of the network, even though these may seem very similar, that they become very different. Of course, today we don't so often use axial maps. We use uh, road centerline maps that you can download from the net and edit in different ways and so forth. Uh, but having this theory in the back of your head, you can realize also that the road center line also can be understood as an affordance of uh, visibility and accessibility. It's not the same thing as the axial line, which has more, maybe, stronger uh, limitations to how to describe, but in a sense, we can understand that the road center line does the same thing. It, sh it uh, shows you uh, creates an affordance of visibility and accessibility. Again, the theory liberates in that sense, so we can see different ways of description staying within the same theoretical framework. Now, that was representation of space. Uh, let's go on and also look at these different variables of distance, density, <coughs> and differentiation. Uh, first of all, yes, that's what I said. Uh, so let's move on to how to measure distance in this. Uh, as I said, this is what we do and what we describe the, the, the street network as, an, as a network using graphs. So we just have nodes and links. And then we can start to measure distances within this network. And regularly we, have, we, know, uh, we, are, uh, um, we know we are accustomed to measuring uh, what we could call specific distances between a location A and a location B. But in network analysis, you often do something else. You can, of course, do this, but uh, do something else, trying to capture the whole structure of the network. And that is measuring something called centrality. And that is not the distance from point A to point B, it's the distance from point A to all locations. And it makes sense, centrality. Where am I in relation to everything else? Uh, so this is something that's the more common uh, distance measure used uh, in our models and in uh, a lot of, uh, of space syntax uh, uh, research. To complicate things a little bit, you can measure also centrality in different ways. <coughs> first of all, uh, what I said now, first, uh, what, how close are you to all other locations within the network? That is something called closeness centrality. Närhet. It makes a lot of sense again. You can sense that, right? I'm close to things, whatever they are. But you can also measure something called betweenness centrality, and that is a little bit more tricky. It's about something being very much mellan saker, between things, right? So if you imagine traveling between all locations, what node will you pass most often? On the way to something else, maybe. So that becomes a very different type of measure, but it's still a, a kind of centrality measure. And in the end, a, a distance measure. Now we could start also to uh, quantify these distances in different ways. And of course, you can uh, quantify uh, distance or measure distance in very different ways. Uh, you can measure it as time and most often also in, as a cost, but we stay within measures of uh, distance as, a sp as space. <coughs> but even that you can measure in many ways. You see how things grow. <laughs> uh, we could measure, for instance, the distance as a topological distance. That is three topological steps saying that each axial line or each segment in itself is a measure of distance. Again, this makes a lot of sense from the point of view of affordances, because what is it that I see? It's a, 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 what is it that I measure? I measure a distance of how much I can see, and then I turn a corner and I have another distance of how much I can see. So you could measure it in these, let's say, affordances, amount of spaces that you can overlook and access. And that's a topological measurement, and it proves much more powerful than it much may seem often overriding in lots of space syntax research, distance is measured in metric terms. And we know this, you know, 
uh, 500 meters can be so different. Sometimes a very long distance in certain locations, and other times it's not. So this, ad this adds something that is not found in the regular measurements. But you could uh, make this a little bit more sophisticated by saying that, well, even though we measure it topologically, we could also say that to turn uh, just 45 degrees is different from turning 90 degrees. So that's another way of measuring. How many angular shifts are you actually doing within the area? So it's an angular distance. Again, though, it's very much connected to you know, human uh, uh, perception and, and so forth. And then, of course, we can <coughs> do the next thing, which is uh, set radius, radii on this. We don't need to measure the whole network. We can select and say, let's just measure within 500 meters. So from each location, each node, within a, a, a radius of 500 meters, how much do you reach? Or how, how central are you in your, in your network? And then you can do it for one kilometer, you can do it two kilometers, or for 30 kilometers, and so on. So you get very different effects. And you see that the more you zoom out, the major roads ap appear, the more local you go, the local streets appear, and so forth. Now, you can also do something very interesting and very important, I think, that we don't have time to develop fully, but is essential in understanding cities, is that if you add these kind of different radii measures, you will, you will see that certain locations have interesting combinations of these different uh, radii. Maybe some are not at all central locally, but extremely central globally in the whole system, or the opposite, or some remain very central throughout all of these. And that means that the importance of that location may be um, uh, big, both locally in the medium and globally. That is, it kind of makes these different scales. This is extraordinarily exciting territory to look into, and has been looked into in space syntax a lot. <coughs> so anyway, we can present now models that uh, for, for all of these cities, where we can do all these kind of measurements. Uh, and it's just to start having fun with them. <coughs> uh, going over to density, I will try to do that briefly because Meta will uh, connect with that much more. It's the thing that we talk about mostly when we say how cities should develop. We are all kind of obsessed with how cities should be densified these days, not least Gothenburg, even though it's such a complicated concept. Um, uh, uh, simply because the same density as we normally re measure them can be expressed in so many ways. So if the politicians strongly say we should densify Gothenburg because it's good, are they talking about that or that or that? Because it's the same density. So how does that help us? Or like Meta and Per has done so extensively throughout Europe, looked at these and uh, developed different tools for measuring density and identifying uh, typologies of this, and Meta will talk more about that. Uh, again, it's the same density. So, where are we to go? Just to briefly touch on different ways of measuring <coughs> um, um, uh, density. The most, two most basic is, of course, floor space index that concerns how much new floor space you, through building, ac add to an area. But you can also talk about ground space uh, density, and that is how much land do you cover with buildings? What are the footprint of buildings compared to the area that you look at? And there are other ways here, and we'll, Meta will look get, t tell you more. But there are other things, and that's uh, something I think also John touched upon, uh, that is combining these kind of measures with what you do in space syntax. Talk more about accessibility and distance and relation between things. So instead of measuring just the density, as it's called area-based, how densely built is this piece or this piece uh, on that piece of land compared to that and compared to that, we could instead start looking at how much floor space do I reach within a radius from this location. And often this is much, uh, it, you're looking for different things, but this can be extraordinarily revealing because you see what you have around you. And of course, density normally also correlates highly with the amount of people 
in the area. So just illustrating a little bit more, because this was work in a, a started in KTH a long time ago by Alex, Alexander Ståle and Daniel Koch, who is also here, and myself to some degree, developing uh, ways of describing these things. <coughs> so you have uh, building density on um, areas, area-based density. We use the street network, or in this case the axle map actually, to calculate the accessibility of density instead and we get a very different way. It's the same data, but it's just analyzed in different ways. So this could be useful for certain things, but I think everybody realizes this could be <laughs> extraordinarily exciting too. And this is something we also can do here uh, in all kinds of ways. For instance, then now we have this for all this, uh, the cities, <coughs> so we can compare the accessibility to uh, floor space, for instance, within a radius of 500 meters, or with 200, two kilometers, uh, below, or whatever you like, and we can see how these things changes. And do you see how this in the end can develop into a very particular description of a location and the potential of that location, the accessibility to all these things? Which often is the end in, I mean, in urban planning, uh, trying to understand what will Jan Torjet be if we do this, or how do we create a similar place in Frihamnen? Well, <laughs> Well, here we can have some support. Moving all also over to the idea of differenti differentiation, which is a little bit uh, less developed than the others, but uh, Jane Bobkova, who is a PhD student with us, is trying to develop this further now. <coughs> but the general idea is that we also use space not only to intensify the um, um, uh, certain locations by building more floor space in the same location, it's a fundamental thing to do for an architect <laughs> or for humans throughout the ages. But another thing, maybe even more fundamental, is that we create boundaries. And we often explain that for reasons like, yeah, it's because it's the weather or things like that. But uh, it's also a way of categorizing things. If you have a, a wall, the thing on the one side is something different than in, on the other side. So it's a fundamental way of categorizing things, differentiating things, not least people, right? And thereby also creating diversity, in a sense. So this is the general idea, what we call here the idea of spatial capacity, to develop that further. And we could be illustrated here. This is the typical chest of drawer of a teenager, right? You have one drawer and you have everything in it, all your clothes, and then you just get whatever you need. A little bit more sophisticated, you can have two drawers and suddenly you have trousers and tops, right? So you can have... And if you have four drawers, yeah, you can start to sort things even better. It's a fundamental effect of a space, of architecture. Suddenly you have a capacity to differentiate things more particularly. And of course we do this on all kinds of scales. This is very slow. <coughs> uh, on the larger scale, of course, we can see uh, between nations, we're very... Uh, strong on that. This is one nation, that's another nation, and the, what happens here is very different from over there. And one thing could be, for instance, how we subdivide space very differently in different, la different countries. So in former uh, Republic of Czechoslovakia, we did not divide land, it's just one piece. While in Austria, on the other side of the border, yes, we, la we divide land differentiate who is allowed to do what, where, and so forth. So there you see that. But of course also in architecture we build spaces to differentiate the different things that we do. And of course in cities this is uh, expressed most distinctly in the uh, plot systems of cities that can vary dramatically. As uh, Jana was saying, in Sweden we have small cities with big plots. That says a lot about Sweden, I think, but that's another discussion. And in Britain, you maybe find the opposite. Big cities, or at least London, but small plots. It's a different idea. <coughs> and one thing, of course, when we build new areas, trying to mimic older areas, we often do not see this connection, right? We miss that. So this is something we also look into, and uh, how that also could be a planning tool, and it could be measured just as density from area-based or plot-based, and we can start to study different plot systems in the cities that we have around us in this way. <coughs> Just adding a little bit that we also can do, of course, do um, a lot of accessibility to whatever attractions 
or amenities you have around you. So for instance, ac in this case, it's the accessibility to residents uh, within 500 meters in Stockholm and Amsterdam, or it could be uh, attractions in general, uh, both public and private of different kinds, or it could be, oh, it's a bit slow, uh, local markets, more economic activity, or it could be other architectural things like entrances and so forth. So there's a tremendous amount of that. So anything you can put, give a, a geographic uh, location, you can make this ac accessibility uh, analysis of. And of course, the interesting would be to make combinations here of the interesting combinations. Now, what we want to do also is not, of course, I speak a lot about spatial form and how to analyze that, but we also need to uh, connect this in, in, into human activity or certain things. And one thing that in space syntax has been proven over and over again is the impact of the configuration of the street network and pedestrian movement in cities. So we wanted also to connect some kind of large-scale uh, observation of that kind to our model as a part of the model in a, in a sense. And we took help here by Bambi Labs using new technology. And we have, we have a, a, a representative of uh, Bambi Labs here today. Uh, so what we did was actually to scan mobile phones, but anonymized mobile phones, um, using a technique that Bambi has developed, and it's possible to use throughout Europe, actually. Uh, and we made a large uh, observation set in, the, in Stockholm, London and Amsterdam over three weeks, uh, putting uh, scanners of uh, mobile phones in different locations uh, uh, over a week's time. <coughs> so some facts about that. Um, it's anonymous Wi-Fi signals. Uh, they are placed at streets in sections, as you can see over there. Uh, we had in, in uh, uh, about 18 to 20 different areas spread out in the city. So it concerns about 300 streets in each city. Uh, they were chosen with different densities and types and building types. Also the streets were done that. And it's done uh, during three weeks in October. So one city a week. So in that sense, it's not totally comparable, but it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of analysis interpretation needed for now about this. But it's, uh, it was counts made from 6 in the morning to 10 in the evening. So it's an extraordinary amount of data that we collected. Uh, but it was done weekdays and uh, also shifted between days. So that we, you, know, you can see faults that you need to be careful with and so forth. Anyway, it created an extraordinary amount of observation data. And the interesting thing here is that we know not just that certain amount of people have passed certain streets. We also know, to some degree, how they have walked, from what location, if they walk through the area. We also know the speed of the movement because we can measure the time. So there's a lot. Now, now we would <laughs> like to look into this with the help of the other universities here and look at this data and see what we can do. It was, it's a tremendous amount. But the first step is, of course, try to also make a kind of statist uh, some make a statistical model of this, seeing that whether the spatial form that we uh, analysis in analysis. Uh, in different ways, uh, correlates with also our observation data. <coughs> and there are earlier extensive um, uh, studies of that kind done before, not least at US UCL, uh, and one of the most well-known is uh, Hilly and Ida in 2005, which concerned 357 stations in four different urban areas. And it proved very high correlations between 0.5 to 0.7, saying maybe that between 50 to 70 percent of the pedestrian flows could be predicted or captured by the model. When we look at ours, we do not get that strong numbers. We got 0.44, but this is for Stockholm, which has been very problematic earlier in this sense. Uh, we have not had that kind of strong correlations that we had in Stockholm, uh, in London. Uh, and now we have just a first look at this data. It actually, Jana produced the last numbers just a few days ago. Uh, and I think it's quite an extraordinary correlation given that we have such a spread out set of uh, areas uh, and that uh, Stockholm is a very planned city, so there's a lot of other things uh, uh, pulling uh, 
pedestrian movement apart from the streets network. Anyway, we will be looking through this and we think there's a lot of interesting stuff hidden here. If you start to look at the particular areas, which often have their kind of pedestrian logic of their own, or different types of areas. So there's lots of to, to look into. So actually we're quite satisfied to just have a first run and get that kind of a strong uh, correlation for this. To be careful here, we say that this is measured stepwise. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that because we run out of time, I think. <coughs> uh, anyway, we have other things that we can add to this. We have, of course, the, uh, the street network, but can also add now the plot system and the density distribution, creating a, a richer model for, for pedestrian flows. And if we add all of this, we get a much stronger correlation of 0.52. Uh, which says that with this, these three layers, we can, in a sense, then capture or um, uh, predict the pedestrian flows up to 52%. It's, again, the first thing. Let's spend time on this and look through this in carefully. But we also looked at another thing, and that is a statistical model for, for local uh, markets. And again, adding <coughs> uh, more or less the same uh, different uh, parameters or the variables here of uh, density, plots and um, street system, we were able to uh, predict, um, find correlations for Stockholm of 0.57, for Gothenburg 0.52 and for Eskilstina 0.50. So it's kind of again, we have a very basic and strong correlation here that we will work on. Interesting also is that we find these at the same it's the same radii of local, very local uh, 500 meter radii for all of them. So it starts to make some kind of sense. But again, this is just the first try. There's a lot of work ne needed to be done.